Thank you for joining us. My name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Britton. I'm at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today we're going to have a webinar on topics of interest for people with epilepsy. I'm uh, grateful to have the assistance of three colleagues of mine. Uh, Dr. First I will speak and then Dr. Jerry Shi from Mayo Clinic in Florida will speak on the topic of maximizing safety for patients with epilepsy. Then my colleague Dr. Joe Servin at Mayo Arizona will speak. Uh, his topic will be video EEG monitoring for patients with seizures. And finally, Dr. Gregory Casino, my colleague at Mayo in uh, Rochester, will speak regarding new surgical treatments for patients with epilepsy. So without further uh, delay, I will get started on my topic. I'll be speaking about seizure medications, when to start and when to stop. When a person has a first seizure, the question of uh, starting whether to start treatment or not comes up naturally. There are several questions that should be asked before a treatment is started automatically, however. Uh, the risks that patients and their families are concerned about include what is the risk that uh, the person will have another seizure, what is the risk if no treatment is started, and what is the risk if treatment is started. Steps to consider before making a final decision about this include the following. First, one must verify that the episode of concern was actually a seizure. There are seizure mimickers, which I'll go over in a few minutes. Second, rule out whether a reversible cause started the seizure or whether it was due to a seizure condition. Thirdly, one needs to assess the uh, risk of further seizures. If that risk is deemed high, treatment would appear to be appropriate after a first seizure. If low, maybe not. And fourthly, one needs the risk, like anything, the risk of treatment, uh, weigh the risk of treatment versus no treatment. First, one must verify the diagnosis. There are several conditions that can mimic seizures uh, to the untrained eye and even to certain doctors, say in the emergency room uh, or in a uh, primary care physician's office where they haven't seen a lot of seizures, uh, several events that people can have can resemble seizures when they're not. Uh, one common episode of loss of consciousness that can occur in people is a phenomenon called syncope. A common term for syncope is a fainting. During a faint, people can exhibit jerks of their body which can look like seizures. Uh, panic attacks sometimes can resemble seizures. Uh, people can also have uh, sleep disorders, which uh, cause unusual behaviors during sleep, which may be mistaken for seizures. Migraine and stroke or TIA-like events can be confused with seizures because they start suddenly like seizures do. Uh, movement disorders, tremors, other uh, conditions that cause unusual neurologic movements can be mistaken for seizures. In children, breath holding can lead to loss of consciousness and even jerking, which can resemble seizures. And finally, there's a phenomenon called behavioral spells, where a person will become unresponsive and may exhibit many behaviors that in many ways resemble seizures. All these can cause confusion and may lead to inappropriate initiation of treatment. Tools that are used to make the diagnosis of seizures include the office visit with clinical exam, the EEG, which is an assessment that looks at electrical activity of the brain, brain. Most importantly, the telephone and talking to witnesses who saw the event. That's probably the most important of the four that I'm showing. When you've decided that when one has decided a seizure has occurred, it's important to determine whether a reversible or temporary cause was in place. Uh, causes, uh, some conditions can lead to a seizure, including electrolyte abnormalities such as low uh, sodium. Uh, certain medications may produce a seizure. Uh, low blood sugar can as well. Um, in contrast, there are other conditions that uh, might lead to a more permanent uh, seizure condition, which I've listed on the slides. If a cause is reversible, reversing the cause is the order of the day, not necessarily starting treatment. 
So I've had a seizure. What's my risk of another seizure? If one collects the results from several studies that have been done over the years, those studies suggest uh, 22 to 40 percent of a person who has a first seizure will have another one in the next six months, 29 to 65 percent in the next year. So if you flip this upside down, nearly half of people who had a first seizure will not have another one. So there's a some controversy in whether to start a treatment or not. You don't know who that is going to be in the 50% who won't have a seizure again. What factors increase the risk of more seizures? An abnormal neurologic exam, abnormalities on the EEG, evidence of a brain injury or lesion, onset of the seizure during sleep, certain epilepsy syndromes, and a family history of seizures. Risk factors are important to assess because they help uh, Cal help them calculate what the risk of more seizures is. If the patient is deemed to having very few risk factors, the rate of further seizures is 30 to 39 percent. Still pretty high, but not as high as if they have more than one risk factor, so in which case the seizure recurrence rate may be 50 to 73 percent. If you start treatment after a first seizure, uh, clearly the, the rate of recurrence is lower in one study, 18% of people who initiated treatment had another seizure during the duration of the study uh, versus those who were assigned to no treatment after a first seizure, 39% had a relapse. So treatment reduces the rate, especially in high-risk groups. So in summary, after a first seizure, make sure the diagnosis of the seizure is clear, reversible causes have been ruled out, and then do a careful risk assessment to try to answer the question whether the uh, health and functioning risk from further seizures is high enough to warrant treatment. So that's when should I start? How about when can I stop medication? The question of whether a person can stop NA epileptic medications is fairly frequent in the office practice. At five years of follow-up, 75% of people will have at least a two-year remission of seizures if 40% will have a five-year remission. While they may be on medications, it's very difficult for the doctor to know for sure if uh, the seizure freedom is due completely to medication or if the patient's need for seizure medication has lapsed. Reasons prompting desire to discontinue medications are listed here, side effects, uh, uh, concern about birth defect risk. If a woman is on seizure medication, may make her wonder, wonder whether she should continue it or not. The cost, fear of long-term side effects, uh, inconvenience, and even if a person is seizure-free on medications, they don't feel completely clear of the condition. Some quotes from people who've uh, considered discontinuing medication uh, have stated the following, I just want it out of the way, it being epilepsy. So hopefully you don't have to say, put down on forms that you've got epilepsy. And uh, I read a lot of articles that basically said it wasn't a good idea to be pregnant on medication, so maybe I sh if you could come off the medication, you should. In assessing patients' uh, risk uh, uh, attitudes regarding discontinuing medication, 20% say they would take a 75% of recurrence just to see if they still needed to be on medication or not. In the bottom bullet says uh, successfully discontinued medication are generally more satisfied than those who remain seizure-free on medications. So the freedom for medications is a big deal to people, no doubt about it. What is the risk of stopping medication? In the clinical studies, uh, the relapse rate after a two-year period of seizure freedom uh, showed 12, a broad range, 12 to 63 percent had a recurrence during the period of uh, anti-epileptic drug uh, discontinuation. Most studies show a 30 to 40 percent rate of seizure recurrence. Risk factors that point to a person more likely to have or person to be able to possibly successfully go off medication is if they've been seizure free for two to five years, have a single seizure type, a normal neurologic exam, and a normal EEG. Here's a graph showing the recurrence rate in people who've stopped medication therapy. Risks for recurrence include onset of seizures after age 12, epilepsy due to a brain lesion, the presence of low IQ and abnormal neurologic exam, 
abnormalities on the EEG, the family history of seizures, and poor control at the beginning of the disorder. Factors that favor success are the absence of a brain lesion, no history of generalized tonic clonic seizures or myoclonic seizures, a normal EEG, a normal neurologic exam, and relative uh, easy control at the beginning of treatment. Also, onset between ages 2 and 12 is a risk factor favorable for the possibility of withdrawal. This slide shows the more risk factors you have, the higher is the relapse risk, ranging from 11% if you have no risk factors to 89% if you have three or more. So in summary, can I discontinue medication? One should have a minimum of two years without a seizure. Uh, the neurologic exam should be normal, EEG normal. You should seek advice from an epilepsy physician and then weigh, carefully weigh the implications if you do have a breakthrough seizure on uh, work and activities of life. So thank you for your attendance to that. Uh, now we'll move to Dr. Jerry Shi, who will be speaking about maximizing safety for patients with epilepsy. Yes. There you go. Hi. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. A hearty hello from warm and balmy Florida. So what I like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is to talk about some ways and how we can maximize the safety in patients with epilepsy. Um, so in terms of some of the common issues in patients who are dealing with uh, epilepsy and in families who have members with epilepsy, it's important to realize that for the most part, bumps and bruises and cuts tend to be the most common injuries associated with seizures. However, it is important to note that we can have much more serious injuries, and those are related usually to falling or losing awareness, uh, striking a sharp object, uh, especially if one is in a hazardous environment. So those tend to be the more serious injuries. And of all of the more important things to avoid is obviously the, uh, the issue of accidental death, uh, and the most common cause of accidental death in the population of people with epilepsy is bathtub drowning. We recognize that if we cannot eliminate all seizures, we still need to take steps in order to make our immediate environment much safer. So if a seizure occurs, that the patient can be safe. Um, in terms of overall safety tips, and what I like to do is then go over some safety tips for the patients and patients' families, is, is to realize that every individual has to find the balance between safety, functionality, and aesthetics. I'm just going to go and give you some tips on how we can maximize safety in the home and in the kitchen, but again, everybody has to sort of individualize what is to their best interest. First and foremost, I advocate that people put in non-slip carpets instead of wooden floors. I also advocate covering sharp corners and avoiding the use of glass tables. Obviously, if patients fall and, and fall on the table, crack the glass, they can be cut severely. I also uh, advocate avoiding uh, working on ladders or unprotected heights. We know that if you fall from even a height of two or three feet off the ground, that you can sustain much more severe injuries compared to just on regular ground. So it is important to avoid being on ladders or unprotected heights. It's also important to keep uh, power cords free of the general walkway. Uh, in the case of a seizure, one can trip over the cords, can knock over appliances, and suffer electrocution injuries. So again, it's important to clear the power cords from the walkways and the hallways. As far as cooking is concerned, if possible, I would advocate using the microwave for the majority of your cooking. And thus, it's important to avoid open flames. So if you need to have a stove at home, it's probably better to have an electrical stove rather than a gas stove. And lastly, even though it's maybe nice to have nice fine china, probably the use of unbreakable or non-breakable dishes and cups uh, offer a much more safe alternative compared to fine china and other glass products. In terms of water safety, I would advocate taking a shower instead of a bath and also consider the use of shower chairs. Use a rubber mat 
or some sort of non-skid strips in the tub or the shower floor to prevent slips and falls. And I would also advocate that you set the hot water temperature in your house to a maximum of 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I know some patients really like to have that nice hot bath or hot shower, but from a safety standpoint, I think it's important to make sure that if for whatever reason you have a seizure and the hot water is running, that that maximum temperature is 110 degrees. And for those of you who are swimmers like I am, never swim alone. I repeat, never swim alone. Either use a buddy system in which you have somebody who is of equal or larger size to you, so if you have a seizure they can pull you to safety, or swim in a, in a public place in which there are lifeguards uh, available, so such as like a, a gymnasium or a swim, public swimming pool. In terms of safety related to the use of uh, electronic equipment or safety in terms of use of fire prevention, if you're at a campfire, you're at a barbecue place, sit back or stay back from the open flames. If you do need to use a stove, if that microwave just isn't doing it for you and you need to use a stove, try to cook on the back burners so that in case you sustain a seizure, you will be uh, less likely to sustain a burn injury. If you need to have an open fireplace or wood stoves or radiators, try to install protective guards. Don't smoke or use matches when you're alone. And, you know, it, it, it increases the chances of burn injury, but also if you're alone in the house and matches on or you're smoking, um, that can cause fire in, in the structure and in the home. So it's important to not use uh, matches or to smoke when you're alone. If you're using electrical machinery for cutting, for chopping, for drilling, again, if you have to use that, please use safety guards. Okay? And then for all electronic equipment or electrical equipment, please buy those that have automatic stop switches. So when you are not actively operating the device, that it will automatically stop. So these are some of the prevention and safety tips when using fire or uh, equipment safety precautions. In terms of recreation, always use protective gear. And always use protective gear. That probably goes for everybody, but especially so if a patient is dealing with seizures. I recommend low impact exercises uh, for patients with epilepsy. So walking, uh, jogging, those are preferable. And, and it's important to be honest with yourself about your level of seizure control. If you've got very good control of your seizures, you could probably do more. But if your seizure control isn't that good, then really be careful about doing what I call medium risk or high risk recreational activities. Medium risk activities include contact sports such as football, hockey, lacrosse, ice skating, gymnastics, horseback riding, or boating. Those are medium risk activities. So if you're having frequent seizures, it may be best to avoid those. High risk activities include hang gliding, motor sports, rock climbing, mountain climbing, and scuba diving. And if you're even having some seizures, it's probably best to avoid those altogether. So it's important to play and play hard, but let's be safe. When it comes to traveling, if at all possible, travel with somebody who is aware of your seizure disorder and can help if needed. When you pack medicines, please remember to pack it in your carry-on luggage. And I always advocate pack an extra several doses just in case. Uh, for many of those of you who travel, like uh, you know, Dr. Britton, Dr. Casino, and Dr. Servant and I do, you know that the, uh, the airports are not the most uh, on time these days. So always pack extra medication just in case. And if you happen to be traveling outside the country or to a remote destination, I think it's important to talk with your doctor about how to come up with good plans to maximize safety. Uh, and I can tell you, some of my patients when they travel to remote destinations will sometimes ask for a medication uh, such as a Ativan or Valium that they can carry along with them in case they're not close to medical attention and they have uh, unforeseen and, and frequent seizures. Last but not least, driving. 
do not drive if you're having seizures or you're having significant side effects from medications that affect your ability to safely operate a motor vehicle. Different states have different laws in regards to the restrictions of driving with epilepsy. So know the laws in your particular state and follow them, please. Now I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes talking about sudden unexplained death in epilepsy or SUDEP. This is a tough topic to talk about, but it's an important topic to talk about because I want to talk about ways in which you can protect yourself. So SUDEP is a term which applies to a person with epilepsy who dies unexpectedly and the death is not due to an accident or to known seizure activity. It's relatively rare. It happens to about 1 in 1,000 people diagnosed with the seizure disorder, but that's still 1 in 1,000 too many. The cause is unknown, but what we do know is that one of the greatest risk factors for having SUDEP is in patients having frequent seizures, especially grand mal seizures, or what we call generalized tonic-clonic seizures. So what can patients and families do to reduce the risk of SUDEP? Well, first and foremost, get the best seizure control possible. If you're not having seizures, you're not having SUDEP. If your seizures are not well controlled on your current treatment regimen, it's important to ask your healthcare provider about other medications or other treatment options, such as epilepsy surgery, neurostimulation, or even certain types of dietary therapy. But the point is, is if you're not having good seizure control, have a conversation with your doctor. If your brain MRI is normal, there are some studies that suggest if your brain MRI is normal and there isn't a good known reason for why you're having seizures, talk to your doctor about having a cardiac or heart evaluation. And last but not least, consider obtaining a noise monitor for the bedroom or some sort of seizure alert monitor uh, that may help in terms of warning people that you're having a seizure. Ultimately though, the best safety measure is good seizure control. And to a certain degree, many of my patients tell me that they can to a certain degree control or affect and help decrease their seizure frequency. And these are some of the things that over the years I found and that patients have taught me that they use in terms of lowering the chances of having seizures. One, take your medication or medications regularly and at the right times as prescribed by your doctor. Please get enough rest and sleep because we know that if the brain is tired, it's more electrically unstable, more likely to fire off into a seizure. Minimize stress. Now that's easier said than done. We all have stress. Everybody has stress. But if there are ways that when you recognize that you have stress to try to minimize it, that will be helpful. Whether it's listening to music, doing yoga, watching a movie, talking to friends on the phone, anything that you can do to constructively lower your stress level will be helpful in minimizing seizures. That gets me to the next point. Engage in regular exercise. That is a known stress reducer, so engage in some sort of regular, safe exercise regimen. I always advise my patients to moderate, doesn't mean you have to completely cut out, but moderate caffeine and alcohol intake, okay? because we know for some patients those are seizure triggers. It is important to avoid recreational drugs, especially cocaine and amphetamine, which are two of the drugs known to lower a patient's seizure threshold and make it easier for them to have seizures. And last but not least, avoid seizure triggers. For example, certain patients, when they play video games, they tend to have more seizures when they're in flashing lights. So if there is a, a something in your environment, a stimulus in your environment that tends to make it easier for you to have seizures, try to avoid that, even if it happens to be something really fun. So. I like to just summarize by saying that even though we may not be able to prevent all seizures, it is important for us to maximize safety, okay? And it can be done with a little bit of work. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shi. Now I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Servin at Merrill, Arizona, who will speak about video EEG monitoring. Dr. Servin. 
Thanks, Jeff. And it's a pleasure to be here. Greetings from uh, Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And I'm going to focus my remarks to a particular study that actually all of the speakers today are involved in, which are video EG monitoring services. Sometimes as we do the evaluation to sort out uh, the diagnosis of epilepsy, confirm it, or maybe we're thinking about uh, more aggressive treatment options, the first step in clarifying that diagnosis sometimes means bringing someone to the hospital. And video EG monitoring, or long-term video monitoring, is done in an epilepsy monitoring unit. The purpose of EMU, short for Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, is really fourfold. It's to diagnose spells that we're not sure are seizures themselves, maybe not responding to medications, or they're bad case of epilepsy that aren't responding to those medications, so we want to confirm that. Maybe we want to understand the seizure type or characterize those seizures. Sometimes we do medication changes, and sometimes that only can be done safely in an inpatient environment, so therapeutic interventions to help. And then lastly, and very commonly, we bring people into a epilepsy monitoring unit to evaluate whether they are surgical candidates. These admissions are important because up to 25%, and that's a very conservative estimate, the diagnoses are changed, leading to a very different course of action for those individuals. So this is a very important item that when it is proposed, oftentimes many questions come up. So why have a monitoring unit? Well, we know that by the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Neurology, having an epilepsy monitoring unit is part of having showing that you have quality, that you can take care of these complicated patients. It's necessary for any neuroscience center. It's something important for quality rankings, such as U.S. News and World Report. It's part of the new technology that is essential for managing individuals who have epilepsy. And it's important to confirm the diagnosis so that we know we got it right, so that there aren't unexpected emergency room visits or, hot or clinic visits that aren't necessary. We know that we have the right diagnosis. The most important thing in an epilepsy monitoring unit besides having the tools and the technology is the team. And all of the Mayo Clinic sites have an epilepsy monitoring unit all surrounded by a team. That team includes special doctors or neurologists with training in this area called epileptologists. They include nursing, which are all trained in the management of seizures in the hospital environment. EEG technicians, neuropsychologists to assess memory and language and mood, neuroradiologists to help us with the images, and then neurosurgeons who help obviously in doing surgeries when they are deemed necessary. When is epilepsy monitoring unit most helpful? When should you expect that that's likely to come in? Well, when someone has spells, and let's say they've been put on medication and they're not responding, or they have spells and we just don't know what it is, that is one big reason to clarify, are they really seizures in of themselves, or is it something that looks like seizures, kind of like what Dr. Britton had brought up in his presentation. That's how we prove it. Maybe we need to figure out what's the right drug for you, and so we need to classify those seizures to understand what seizures are occurring so that we pick the right treatment. Maybe we need to change the medication for seizures, and we need to do it in an environment that's very safe, as opposed to letting the person out in, uh, at home. Seizures that are completely not controlled is, uh, is an often common rationale. And then, of course, the pre-surgical evaluation that I've mentioned. Epilepsy monitoring or video monitoring isn't that helpful when it's sudden emergency room admissions, we all do it, and all our speakers do it on occasion, but oftentimes that's not really the purpose here. This is more when things are planned. If the primary problem is a mood issue or an anxiety issue, this is probably not going to be the most useful tool in terms of settling out the side effects of epilepsy that can include depression or anxiety. Patients who have medically unstable problems, problems where 
not only do you have seizures, but the lungs and the hearts aren't working or something's not right, that may not be the right place for this as well. And then this one you could argue when you have seizures that are just consistently happening to the point that it's an emergency, it may be more appropriate to have you in an ICU than in one of these units, although we've all uh, admitted people to the unit with status epilepticus on occasion. The goal of uh, the EMU admission is to actually record the thing we're trying to stop, which is to record all the events if admitted for that diagnosis. We know that we like to, in pre-surgical evaluations, we like to record more than one seizure, but sometimes one is all we can get. And sometimes we do things to encourage those seizures to happen. So you may find yourself having uh, things such as hyperventilation, having light shined on you like photic stimulation, exercise with a treadmill or other or bike that is brought into the room. Yes, sleep deprivation on occasion and oftentimes pulling away medications carefully and very uh, clearly done with a way of not promoting uh, an emergency or provoking an emergency. When someone is admitted to the epilepsy monitoring unit, oftentimes it's early in the week, early in the day, so that we can bring you in and get you situated nice and comfortable. You'll often be evaluated by neuropsychologists either in the hospital during that time or in and around the time of that admission. On occasion, because seizures often come with depression and anxiety, we ask our friends in psychiatry to come help us to make sure that we can help do the best we can to manage those issues. We do those procedures we just talked about that we mentioned to try to provoke seizures such as sleep deprivation or hyperventilation or exercise. And then at the time of discharge, we try to aim for Friday, sometimes it goes on the weekend, we try to make sure you're safe to go home. So we get those medications back and we make sure that they're in good position so that that person is okay to leave and they're going to be fine as they go on uh, and leave the hospital. There is actually quality assessments for epilepsy monitoring units done by the National Association of epilepsy centers. And they've actually leveled out the different varieties of epilepsy centers uh, or epilepsy monitoring units that people can be admitted to. At Mayo Clinic, we tend to reside, all of us are in that level four epilepsy monitoring unit or the highest level, which are seizure, these are patients where seizures are not well controlled and we may consider surgery. So all of the three Mayo Clinic sites have these units at level four stature, which is the highest uh, of levels of epilepsy care, that we can present all options to you should you need it. This is a drawing that we have here where we try to bring out when epilepsy monitoring comes into the equation. And you'll see it's not at the beginning when you have the seizure, and it's not even after you've been seen by a primary care physician. It's typically if there is a question, the diagnosis in question, that leads us to re a referral to an epilepsy center and then onward to a monitoring unit as necessary. So in general and in summary, we are all equipped and ready to take care of you should we, cannot, should we need the help of having to bring you into the hospital for epilepsy or long-term video monitoring services. And we are all certified at the highest level of quality to do this in the best way we can all surrounded by large teams at each of our sites to make sure we can do what's the best for you in terms of trying to control and manage your epilepsy. I appreciate the attention this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Servant. Rounding off our presentation will be Dr. Gregory Casino, my colleague at Mayo Rochester. He'll be speaking about new surgical treatments for epilepsy. Dr. Casino. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, it is an honor and privilege to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, so my remarks will be restricted to the evaluation and treatment of patients who have drug-resistant epilepsy that often is physically, medically, and socially disabling and may be a candidate for a newer surgical therapy. We know that the goal of treatment is for the patient to be seizure-free, not experience adverse effects associated with therapy, and become a participating member of our society. 
Unfortunately, nearly a third of patients with epilepsy have drug-resistant seizure disorders. The first two medications are highly predictive of a medication outcome. Individuals who may be candidates for a surgical therapy have medically refractory or drug-resistant seizures. There is some disabling effect of the seizures or the seizure disorder on quality of life. They have focal or partial epilepsy, and the procedure itself has a low risk for morbidity, and there's a significant potential for rehabilitation. This is a patient who underwent an epilepsy surgical procedure at our institution. The MRI study showed a subtle alteration in the temporal lobe region here. This is preoperatively, and this is the postoperative MRI. And the rationale for epilepsy surgery is to localize the site of seizure onset and have a neurosurgical team remove that region of the brain without introducing any neurologic deficit. This is a 10-year follow-up study that was performed at Mayo Clinic in nearly 400 consecutive patients who underwent epilepsy surgery. And all of these individuals had drug-resistant epilepsy and undergo a comprehensive pre-surgical evaluation. No one single study is utilized to select operative candidates. And these type of operations are now available at all three Mayo sites. What we found was that approximately three out of four, or 75% of patients, are seizure-free after epilepsy surgery during long-term follow-up. Importantly, if you look at the natural history of epilepsy in individuals who have drug-resistant seizure disorders and receive anti-epileptic drug medication alone, probably less than 10% will be seizure-free. There's a number of different MRI abnormalities or localized causes of seizure disorders that may be determined in patients with focal epilepsy. This was a subset of patients who had a cavernous hemangioma, which is a vascular malformation. Uh, nearly 8 out of 10 patients are seizure-free. In individuals who have a low-grade brain tumor, which also may be the cause of a drug-resistant seizure disorder, the numbers may be higher. And in each individual patient, we do a diagnostic evaluation to determine the likely cause of the seizure disorder, the area or region of seizure onset, and what potential adverse effect an operation may have on the individual's neurologic quality of life. Unfortunately, many of our individual patients have medically refractory seizures, but a normal MRI study. And this is a publication from Mayo Clinic which showed that still 60% are seizure-free, but the surgical yield here is not as favorable as when patients have an MRI-identified abnormality or cause for their seizure activity. In individuals who have a normal MRI study, we know that there are many important caveats about these groups of patients that need to be considered. Oftentimes, it is difficult to localize the site of seizure onset, and the patients may have to have intracranial EEG. Patients may have a focal pathology, even if the MRI is normal, such as a malformation of cortical development. And uh, these patients may be surgical candidates because a significant percentage uh, will not respond to medication or conservative management. And as my colleagues have mentioned earlier, we know that the quality of life is directly tied in to the patient being seizure-free. And the burden of epilepsy is significantly greater when patients continue to have recurrent and unprovoked seizure activity. In patients who have a normal MRI and have focal epilepsy outside the region of the temporal lobe, we find that a minority of individuals, unfortunately, are seizure-free, perhaps one out of three. And these are a group of patients that we increasingly are seeing at referral centers where it is difficult to localize the site of seizure onset. We don't know the acquired cause of their seizure disorder, and the patients have a medically refractory epilepsy that is significantly disabling. Advances in imaging at multiple centers, including Mayo Clinic, 
have allowed us to better localize the region or zone of seizure onset that may assist us in surgical planning. It's very important that we understand the cause and location of seizure onset to make a recommendation regarding traditional epilepsy surgery. A technique called CISCOM was developed at Mayo Clinic utilizing SPECT imaging, which is a functional imaging study performed in the epilepsy monitoring unit while the patient is having their characteristic seizure activity. It may give us an idea as to where the area of seizure onset is located. Advances in CISCOM imaging and SPECT scans have been made at Mayo Clinic. This is an example of one patient uh, who had an MRI and we had difficulty localizing the site of seizure onset and very nicely a blood flow change related to the region of the patient's focal epilepsy is identified in this imaging study. And this may have profound implications in terms of directing the surgical strategy because the neurosurgical team has a potential imaging target that may be utilized both for intracranial EEG monitoring as well as for epilepsy surgery. Another example from the same patient in a different orientation, again you see the region of increased blood flow because when the patient has a focal seizure, there may be an increase in the metabolic demand related to the seizure activity and an increase in blood flow that can now easily be imaged. And this again may have profound importance in terms of directing any potential treatment options. Now we know, unfortunately, that only a minority of patients are candidates for epilepsy surgery. If we have a third of individuals with epilepsy having medically refractory seizures, that's a significant population as well over 2 million Americans have epilepsy. The number of operations performed for epilepsy in the United States per year is probably under 1,500 patients. Now in some instances, patients are not being referred to appropriate epilepsy centers, but not uncommonly for a variety of reasons, patients are not appropriate candidates for traditional epilepsy surgery. Newer techniques have now been introduced. Visualized MRI guided laser ablation is a very exciting development that may allow us to provide appropriate treatment for patients who have a focal epilepsy. The MRI is used to guide a laser treatment specifically to cause a temperature change in the brain that may reduce the area of seizure onset. These are imaging studies that are performed during the procedure and the patients have often intraoperative MRI to guide the laser therapy. This is an example of a patient who has epilepsy. Uh, the patient has a area of seizure onset. The laser probe is introduced by the neurosurgical team. This produces a localized change, perhaps with a reduction in morbidity compared to traditional epilepsy surgery because an area or region of brain is not surgically resected. This patient during short-term follow-up has been uh, seizure-free. Other treatments that are now uh, developed, approved by the Food and Drug Administration, and represent a neurosurgical strategy involve neurostimulation. The only device that is approved by the Food and Drug Administration is called the Neuropace Responsive Neurostimulator System. Uh, all three Mayo sites participated in the development and the pivotal clinical trials that were performed prior to FDA approval. This involves an external electronic stimulator that is implanted in the region of the patient's cranium and paddles are placed over the area of seizure on for electrical stimulation. This is largely a palliative therapy that is to reduce seizure tendency. And finally, the last example is a Medtronic deep brain stimulation, which is not yet approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but is approved in the European Union. Uh, this is available at selected centers, and this involves deep brain stimulation, which also may reduce seizure tendency. And the goals of surgical strategy are clearly to reduce seizure tendency and to improve the quality of life of these individuals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, audience, for your attention to our presentation. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to answer any questions you have, and we have some uh, posted already, which I'll begin to uh, go through. First question, 
how do you know if a seizure is not really a seizure? I think that's a very important question. I tried to touch on that in my uh, evaluation. Not infrequently, I'll see a patient who was thought to have had a seizure, and on further inquiry, it turned out they had something else instead. So this is really the starting point of uh, treatment, obviously, a correct diagnosis. Um, the, the, I would say the test of most value for me in making the decision about this is getting a clear description from a direct witness of the event in question. Unfortunately, that isn't always available. The person may have had one and it was unwitnessed. But when that is ava available, that's very valuable. Um, I think I'll have Dr. Servin add to this. He spoke about video EEG monitoring, which we will employ to answer this question. Joe, you want to add anything to this question? Uh, Jeff, thanks. I, I think that uh, it, it, one of the reasons that when the issue comes up to when is, is, some, is a, an event or spell a seizure, when we bring someone in, before we do that, oftentimes we have done routine EEG or we've done an ambulatory EEG, which is an EEG you wear for a day or so. Uh, oftentimes, in, in a vast majority of cases, there's a telltale electrical sign that there's a change that we see the abnormal electrical discharge on the EEG, and in essence helps to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, but that that is actually how one of the tools we use to help us answer that question. The rest is based on the pattern of what we're being told and what is we learn in the history and the neurologic the neurological examination. The next question, two years ago I had a brain surgery to remove scar tissue on my right temporal lobe that was causing my seizures. I have been seizure free for over two years now and I am off most of my medication. What are the odds of the scar tissue coming back? Dr. Casino, you want to take that question? Thank you. Uh, so that's an excellent question and first uh, to the person who posed the question, uh, congratulations because to go two years seizure free after surgery and be successfully withdrawn from medication would indicate that you've had an excellent response to neurosurgical treatment. Uh, you clearly have a seizure disorder in remission. In most cases, when the neurosurgical team refers to scar tissue, they usually are referring to a specific pathology such as mesial temporal sclerosis, which may have a localized neuronal loss and what we call gliosis. And that's different than the scar tissue that's created by the neurosurgeon during the operation. Uh, in cases of patients who have a localized pathology in the temporal lobe, there's very little evidence that neurosurgical treatment itself causes the patient to develop seizures. If you go two years seizure-free, be off medication, excellent response to therapy, I think at this point there'd be no operation itself is going to introduce an abnormality to produce a seizure disorder unless there's a, a complication. But uh, I think your chance of remaining seizure-free would be very good. Obviously, you'll have to be vigilant. Your surgical team will want to have do periodic surveillance to make sure you're remaining seizure-free, but uh, the long-term prognosis would be excellent in that situation. All right. The next question. Um, my daughter has seizures daily. She has tried about all medications. She has a VNS, vagus nerve stimulator. Now the doctors say they are not all seizures. There are some movements that might be dystonia movements. I don't understand what does this mean. Um, this is a very important question. It gets back again to one of my early slides in my presentation, is being as certain as possible that everything that's being treated as a seizure is in fact a seizure. Um, I think it could be very difficult uh, to help uh, make to make this diagnosis uh, based on clinical description alone. Uh, I trust your daughter has undergone video EEG monitoring to try to uh, help determine uh, whether the movements are seizures or not. Uh, that would be my general approach if that has not already been done already. Even so, even though video EEG monitoring is really what we call the gold standard for making a diagnosis of seizures, uh, it can be very tricky even when using that advanced technology, uh, some seizure uh, discharges are difficult to see on EEG. And it may make one think uh, twice about whether an event previously thought to be a seizure was a seizure. Dr. Servin, you want to add at all to, to that? 
Jeff, I, I, I'm pretty comfortable with uh, uh, with your response. So that's exactly how I view it, which is uh, this is always tricky, and this is one of those areas where not only I'm making the assumption that video monitoring has been done, if not, that's a step. The, the second piece is just knowing that something like dystonia it, it can look like seizures, but they're not, it's not a seizure, and they're treated differently. And that's done typically by having certain doctors that just deal with dystonia can be very useful, such as movement disorder doctors. And this is where I, what, what's so great, like especially in Mayo, where you can kind of connect with these other subspecialists, because uh, sometimes that's precisely what you need to do to kind of look at the larger holistic picture. Thank you very much. Dr. Shi, I have a question that would fit your talk well. Um, can you talk about the effect of seizures on the brain? Do they damage the brain? Uh, do seizures increase the occurrence of seizures? Do uncontrolled seizures increase the risk of uh, SUDA? Uh, those are all very good questions, and they really do go at the heart of trying to uh, understand how we can make it safer for patients. Uh, so. First and foremost, I think there are about four questions in there. I'll take them one at a time. So the, the first question is, uh, what is the effect of seizures on the brain? What we know is that a seizure is basically a uh, large release of electrical energy. It's when the, the brain cells are electrically unstable and you get a massive amount of electrical energy released. We know that for very self-limited and typically short seizures, there is likely no significant damage, no damage to the uh, surrounding cells, but it's also important to know that if seizures go on for a long time, that they can cause neuronal damage. And what we typically advocate for patients is if a seizure is going on longer than five minutes, please call 911 or get medical attention. So if there's one thing that we can take away from this is seizures typically last less than a couple of minutes and if a seizure is going longer than five minutes, get medical attention. Call 911. Second question is, is um, can, and I, I interpret it to mean, can seizures beget seizures? Can, if I have a seizure, can it go on to cause more seizures? Now some of the older literature suggests that when a brain starts having seizures, that the more seizure it has, that the more likely it is to trigger seizures later on. That has been shown in animal models, but has not been effectively proven in humans. But again, the important thing to know is, is that we want to control seizures as well as possible now, not next month, not next year. So um, it is uh, very important to keep those seizures under control. Jeff, were there another question in there that I missed? Uh, I think you covered it. All right. Uh, next question is, are there any particular supplements or over-the-counter medications that have been shown to be more active at causing seizures? I think I'll take that question since I mentioned the importance of trying to identify reversible causes of seizures in someone presenting with a seizure. There aren't too many over-the-counter medications that are of great concern with respect to their potential for causing seizures. Uh, sometimes pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine uh, used for cold treatment, occasionally in very, very high doses, might uh, lead to a seizure. At usual doses uh, used on the labeling, uh, over the uh, on the, uh, you know, on, the you know, on, on the product that you buy at the drugstore, though the, the possibility of it causing seizures is very very low. There are certain prescription medications, so I think that I'll take this opportunity to mention that you might want to uh, be be aware of. Uh, there's a uh, antidepressant medication commonly called Welbutrin. It's also used for smoking cessation under the name Zyban, which sometimes can trigger seizures. Uh, a common uh, pain medication called Ultram or Tramadol uh, may produce seizures as well. Many of the other antidepressants have the potential to cause seizures, but we do use them in people who have seizures and depression complicating it. Uh, there are certain antibiotics as well, like the quinolone antibiotics occasionally can 
trigger seizures such as Levaquin and Cipro that you may have heard of. It's best to just make sure your doctor knows that you have a seizure disorder and that they weigh the risk of the medication given your condition. We have about one time for one or two more questions. So I'll go through our list. And um, Dr. Servin, I know you've written on this, so I, I'll, I think I'll ask you about it. Um, I've heard ketogenic diet is good for children with epilepsy. How about adults? How long would I have to be on it to see results? And would I have to stay on it indefinitely to maintain the results? Sure. Uh, Jeff, uh, thanks for that question. Um, the ketogenic diet is uh, a diet that is uh, principally uh, ingestion of high fats to the exclusion of carbohydrates and proteins. Uh, it's actually very effective not only in kids but in adults in which it has been tried uh, on. It works pretty quickly once it's instituted and the way you know it's working is if you check urine, your urine ketones show up positive. Uh, it's a tough diet on two fronts. Number one, uh, you have to be very compliant and therefore for those of you like me who love carbs, it might be a tough uh, sell to basically do. On the other hand, if you don't have that issue, this might be something to do. There are uh, some side effects because this is at the exclusion of carbs and proteins uh, cholesterol may rise, so that has to be watched, and heart health has to be watched. You need to be uh, have nutrient supplements for vitamins just to make sure you get enough. Um, there are new versions, something called the modified Atkins diet, which can work as well. Uh, it's an appropriate choice, and, and it is pretty effective, but so far we have not seen that it necessarily follows through as a long-term cure, like surgery does. Rather, it's helpful while you're on that diet. So if, if carbs are not a big issue to you and you can manage that, it is a, a fair option and it does work. Okay. Um, one final question I'll pose to Dr. Casino. How does gamma knife surgery treat epilepsy? Is laser ablation better? What's the difference? So that's an excellent question. And gamma knife is very good for certain lesions in the brain, uh, and that's quite clear. So tumors and certain vascular anomalies. Uh, the NIH tried to do a study on radiation with gamma knife versus open surgery for epilepsy, but unfortunately they had difficulty with enrollment. We do know that gamma knife has been used for patients who do not have brain lesions like mesial temporal sclerosis. There are anecdotal reports of it being effective. There has been no comparative studies looking at visualized laser therapy versus gamma knife. And they do involve quite a bit difference in terms of radiation exposure with gamma knife. Uh, gamma knife does have the potential for radiation necrosis. Uh, it does have the adverse effects. Uh, at this point, uh, it's largely anecdotal, but it's been used at selected centers. And again, we don't have any comparative uh, data to know how effective it is relative to laser therapy. Okay, well, I want to thank the audience for your attention. It was our privilege to be able to speak to you about, uh, about epilepsy. Um, there are several questions that we were not able to get to in this webinar, and I apologize for that. However, we will try to answer the questions that come in over the following week that we were not able to address. So I want to thank you again very much for your attention, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you.